Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, providing more than 41,000 jobs in the production of wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details at choosewood.com. From St. Louis Public Radio. This is St. Louis on the Air. What is the internet like in prison? No, that's funny, actually, because there's no internet in prison. There, there's, like, none. No, uh, no. In some very limited places, they now will have, like, the thing we're trying to design. But that's very new. So there is no internet access in the prison. That leads you to ask different questions, pursue different inquiries, and build solutions that are fundamentally different. I'm Danny Wisentowski. In prison, the barriers go far beyond just tall walls and locked doors. A prisoner with ambition for a career in tech, for instance, or learning how to code, will find their access to the internet very different than from the outside. If they want to learn to build a website, they'll have to do it without the version of the internet that we all take for granted, without the ability to participate in online forums or just to ask Google a question. Instead, they're on their own. Or rather, they were. In recent years, there's been a push to bring more STEM education to prisons, and the STEM Ops Project, otherwise known as STEM Opportunities in Prison Settings, is working to expand those efforts. STEM Ops will host a national convention in St. Louis this week for researchers and community leaders interested in fostering STEM courses in prison and the hiring of justice-impacted individuals in STEM careers. STEM Ops principal investigator Eden Batashore told our producer that St. Louis is not only a great city for conventions, it's a particularly good place to host discussions about improvements to our justice system. St. Louis also has a history uh, in the um, role of segregation, in the role of um, first legal and Plessy versus Ferguson, and then Um, as that transformed into then, as we know, Jim Crow and institutionalized racism and our systems promoting segregation. St. Louis just has a, has a history that serves as a, as a reminder of why we're doing what we're doing. For Eden, this work is personal. Not long after she graduated from college in 1994, Her roommate was killed in a carjacking by two men, a 19-year-old and a man in his 40s, both from southeast D.C. I think about this situation and where they were in their lives, and I know, deep in my heart, I feel as if we had, at that time, done right by people who were incarcerated and really focused on rehabilitation, enabled this gentleman to overcome substance abuse and see himself as having value and becoming a leader, then when he returned, imagine the difference he could have played in the 19-year-old's life. And imagine that what could have been the consequence And I know that my roommate would likely still be alive, and those two men would not still be in prison for multiple consecutive life-to-life sentences, and their families would still have those men in their families. Eden is particularly interested in bringing STEM education to prison because she says that people who are incarcerated will bring unique perspectives to a field that requires innovative thinking. When you've, got, when you've had the life experiences that lead you to prison, you have a very different understanding of the problems that we face as a society. And that leads you to ask different questions, pursue different inquiries, and build solutions that are fundamentally different. And if we want STEM solutions that help actually solve a number of our problems, we need the incarcerated community and previously incarcerated, to participate in that. 
And that is Eden Batashur, a principal investigator on the STEM Ops Project, which is organizing this week's convention in St. Louis, which is happening this Tuesday through Thursday at Marriott St. Louis Grand. And joining me now are two people presenting in that convention, the co-founders of Unlocked Labs, which works to help prisoners connect to the internet, to their skills, and to a future career outside prison. Unlocked Labs Chief Technological Officer, Jessica Hicklin, welcome to St. Louis on the Air. Thank you. It's nice to be here. And joining us also is Haley Schof, who serves as the Vice President of Justice Programs at LaunchCode. Haley, welcome. Thank you. Jessica, this subject is deeply personal to you. Uh, you yourself spent 26 years in a, a prison for murder that you committed as a teenager. Um, you have come a long way, and I'm so good to see you here outside. Um, and you also became the first transgender inmate in Missouri to have successfully sued for the right to access hormones. And you transitioned in prison, but you also taught yourself how, how to code, and you worked hard to secure yourself a job when you released, and that happened just nine months ago. And now you're here trying to help other prisoners get those skills, find a way to make that bridge. So tell us a little bit about this path, this challenge that you were faced with in, in prison. How do you teach yourself to code when you don't really have access to the internet? <laughs> That's funny. I'll tell you a little bit about this journey. It's a very long journey. Hard to tell you just a little bit. But um, very long version short, <clears throat> I had a friend who used to work at IBM and sort, sort of supported this crazy idea that, you know, hey, we can learn to code without the internet and maybe we can do something with it. Um, so like most coders, I was motivated by a goal, which was access to education. And I had a friend send me a bunch of books on coding. And I happened to have a job in the prison where I worked in a, in a closed circuit television station that I helped start. So I had access to technology, information, and will. And that's generally everybody in life who learns to code. Wow. And maybe just for folks who, who don't have experience with this, what is the internet like in prison? You can't just, you know, you, you can go to a lot of websites, but it, it for my sense, it's, it's that participation, you know, that you, actually exchanging messages with people. Mm. That's where things really are, are much different. No, that's funny, actually, because there's no internet in prison. There, there's like none. No, uh, no. In some very limited places, they now will have like the thing we're trying to design, but that's very new. So there is no internet access in the prison. So where, where were you learning from? Um, I, I literally had a set of hard coded printed books. I mean, they were, I have a stack about this tall, or there's a picture we use sometimes that shows all of the books I had to read, but. Wow. Back to books all the way. Yeah, paper, paper books all, all, all day, every day back in, I don't know, about 15 years ago when I first started looking at these things. Mm -hmm. Now, Haley, I, I wanted to ask you, you, you got to meet Jessica six years ago while she was still in prison. And uh, you had been working in prison education programs for some time. Um, what was your, your impression of, of what Jessica was going through? And is that kind of challenge, teaching yourself to code out of books with paper, um, ancient technology, is, is that common uh, for, for other inmates in that situation? No. Um, and I think it was partially having a fair amount of experience in the prison education world that I was able to see very immediately um, when one of Jessica's mentors reached out that this was something that was happening that was pretty remarkable. And not only the systems that they were building, but also just the amount of motivation and drive and the things that they had figured out were really impressive and unlike anything I had ever seen. Uh -huh. uh, Jessica, how did you, I guess you, you had so much experience in different ways battling the criminal justice system or, uh, you know, you, at least you know, through the courts, certainly uh, for the right to, you know, to, to live your life, to, to have uh, the support and to, you know, have the, um, the kind of existence that uh, is, is one of safety and is one of autonomy and respect. But in prison, many of those things are just not there in, in so many different ways. When it came to learning this kind of trade, learning this skill, what did it take to actually get the, the prison to help you? Um, or was there a sense where they just weren't? Mm, that's a really good question. And it's funny because there's two perspectives of prison, and this is probably not very popular coming from me, but there is the general concept of like the prison industrial complex where like the, all of prison is bad. And there are many things that need to be worked on, many things are broken, and many bad actors. But you can't assume that that is the case always. And in fact, in our situation, um, I approached an administrator with this like, crazy idea of like, hey, we have no staff, we want to teach them classes. Let us build this this education platform to do it with. And we got administrative ap approval to show me. 
Show me what you're talking about, which is where the learning to code without the internet came into play. And we built the first very, very rough version, and it was enough. The administrator said, all right, I like this. Let's see what we can do to support it. And slowly over the years, that went up the administrative chain until we got all the way to the top. And what initially motivated you, you know, to get into STEM, to pursue this, this kind of field? It was something that was already kind of on, on your radar, but what, what happened um, in that moment? Mm -hmm. So I do have to go back a little bit to answer that question Please. because so when, when I went into prison, I had life without parole. And my first day in the Potosi Correctional Center, my introduction to prison was, you have a lot of time. You're going to die here. Figure out what to do with your life. And that was literally my introduction to prison. And it took me about five years to figure out what I was going to do with my life. And that was to do my best to educate folks. That's how I understood giving back for the harm I had caused and trying to make a difference. So I was very motivated to educate me and one of my other co-founders, Spent a lot of years designing programs, facilitating. I was a GED um, <coughs> math volunteer instructor for a while. And then the shortage of prison, uh, prison guards began to happen. So I had this motivation of this is how I understood my purpose in life. I can't do it anymore. And so that was the driving force right there to, okay, I feel a need if I'm going to give back to continue to educate. And apparently technology is the way to do that. Haley, I wanted to ask you, when, when we were hearing from uh, e Eden Batashore earlier and expressing that, that people who are going, who have gone through prison, who have, you know, survived, uh, you know, in, in these environments, they bring something special to, you know, any kind of company or any kind of tech, um, you know, platform that you're trying to build and that there's, there's values here to bring this kind of experience, uh, especially for those people as they come back out. And you've been working in programs, um, you know, in prison for quite some time. Um, does does that ring true for you? The, these latent talents, these these skills that are being built um, in these places that really are translatable and and are um, you know are, are very useful and valuable. Definitely. So there's interesting bodies of research that actually show that entrepreneurial aptitude amongst folks that are incarcerated is higher than the population at large. And I think for people that don't spend a lot of time in and around justice-involved populations, sometimes it's easy to lose sight of the fact that the potential and ingenuity and passion um, amongst all the students that I've worked with and a lot of the folks that I've seen in this universe is just incredibly high. And there's a will to want to give back to the world in some way. And then at the same time, there's a moniker that kind of goes around in these spaces that, you know, the people that are closest to the problem are often closest to the solution. And I think if we think about, you know, where we're moving as a society, we how do we use technology to solve the biggest problems that our society is facing? And technology is not a catch-all for societal problems, but it is a toolkit. And oftentimes it's a toolkit that gets misdirected, I think, away from our most critical challenges. And if we're going to tackle those things head on, how do you go to the source and people that have the most direct lived experience and understanding of some of these problems in order to then develop solutions? Mm -hmm. Jessica, you know, to this point of, of relying on the people closest to the problem to produce the solution, um, you know, this, I think, applies very much to this uh, startup you have, Unlock uh, Ed, um, you know, unlocked, uh, you know, in, in writing, of course. But this this particular issue of bringing tech education to prison, where just giving prisoners and inmates the full untethered internet is just not going to fly. You know, the the prison isn't going to do it. And there could be very good reasons. Um, you know, while you want monitoring, while you want limitations on sort of the interactivity, downloading things. Mm -hmm. So tell us about you know, what Unlocked, uh, Unlock ED uh, you know, does in that space and, and really an example of trying to bring a solution to an environment you know very well. Um, so the very... The simplest way I can explain it is it's like a sandboxed part of the internet, which only has the things that we that should be accessible. So in, in its base uh, implementation, it's just a learning management system like every other learning management system. But one of our interests is, is in an increasing access to prisons to the folks on the outside as well in the sense of there are plenty of content providers in you know, universities, places like that, that are interested in providing access to education. And of course, Second Chance Pell is coming back around. And so there are even more people in the space. So the other thing we do is look at how do we let universities and other content providers who already have content provide access to it without having to adapt it? Because that's the usual solution. Like, hey, if you want to provide your liberal arts course, you have to completely convert it to our thing. So the other thing we do is integration with existing learning management platforms so that when a university or some other provider 
wants to participate in this education process, there's not a heavy lift for them. They can just show up, move the content to the sandbox, and then it'll be available. Mm -hmm. Now, your your program, and I should I should mention I've been uh, note it's unlocked unlocked labs. Unlocked labs is the program. Unlock Ed is the product. I see. Okay, I got it. And and that product is in place at a number of Missouri prisons uh, in Potosi. I, b I believe the one you you were in. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's in a number of other ones. What is the status of those pilot programs, and, and what are things looking like so far? Um, that's always a good question. Um, things are looking very good, honestly, and I'm very excited. Uh, so we have various implementations and phases of pilot. And so in some, we originally started with an offline offering so that it was a literally a sandbox Internet with actually no Internet connection. And in that place, content had to be put on a server that functioned as the proxy Internet. And that has been used in several places to where... The, uh, where the policy conversation continues. Um, but we have also run a live uh, version of it that is hosted on Amazon and is accessible from uh, individuals who are currently incarcerated. So we have varying stages of pilot and they are all, I would say, very successful. And we've been having conversations about how do we scale this in a sustainable way that so it can be not only statewide, but multi-state. Mm -hmm. And it's not, from my, my research, it, it appears that, you know, one of the key uh, tools that, you know, programmers in learning uh, rely on Stack Overflow. Mm -hmm. um, this, you know, basically uh, the Google for if you have a problem with your programming, it's likely someone else has come across it. Yes. And you're discussing, you're, you're at, you know, building these offline versions of the internet, but also mm -hmm. these enormous troves of, of user questions and answers. And those are things that inmates uh, will also have access Access to. They'll have mm -hmm. that window to the outside world, even if it's not variable or live, uh, like the internet version. Well, so maybe an inter interesting detail that gets kind of lost in some of the story is that our platform itself is, is developed by currently incarcerated developers. So we have people who have gone through the coding program who designed this, designed the tech itself. Mm -hmm. uh, again, closest to the solution, closest to, or closest to the problem, closest to the solution, build this solution. And so Stack Overflow is really in a, in a world with no internet the only access our developers have to technical information. And so by them having it available, they, they have the most current information on how you would, uh, coding patterns or solutions to um, scaling problems or things like that. Mm -hmm. And I guess, you know, as we wrap up, I know it's a big subject, but I think a lot of folks listening, they might wonder, you know, why why should we give so many resources to, to prisoners or inmates? Mm -hmm. You know, I think the, the, the kind of ideas of, of what people deserve resources or second chances mm -hmm. um, and, and even, you know, to bring, you know, these kind of technical skills that I think a lot of people do wish they had or, or wish they, that other industries would be renewed with. Mm -hmm. um, what would you want people to know about, you know, investing in, in folks like you, mm -hmm. in people who are, you know, doing this development in prison, uh, not just for their, their who they are right now, but mm -hmm. who they're going to be? That's a hard thing to answer in a very short time. But um, you observed, I went to prison for murder. So at the end of the day, I did the worst thing and caused the most harm that can be done with an action. Um, but I'm also sitting here in the studio with you right now. So while I think there's a whole other conversation around deserve, what people deserve as human beings, um, you can simplify it and say, look, 95% of the people who are incarcerated, of the 2 million people incarcerated in this, this country, are going to be living next door to somebody soon. Let's help them get back into society and succeed. That's the shortest answer I can give. And if, if we don't provide those tools, that's why we have an 83% recidivism rate in this country. It's something to think about. Uh, Jessica, thank you so much for joining us today. Jessica Hicklin is the co-founder and chief technological officer of Unlocked Labs. And Haley, thank you also for coming. Haley Schof is a co-founder of Unlocked Labs and the vice president of the justice programs at LaunchCode. This episode was produced by Emily Woodbury. Audio engineering and podcast design by Aaron Dorr. Our production intern is Avery Rogers. Alex Hoyer is our executive producer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. Our podcast proudly supports St. Louis artists by using music from Life Creative Group.
Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thank you. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com.